Okay, then I think perhaps we start now and I can welcome everybody um, to the first Zero PM webinar of 2023. And also um, it's a special day today. It's a uh, World Water Day. Uh, so this is a day where we should all, you know, think about water and there's a lot of people working in a lot of different places at the moment to accelerate the change to solve the water and sanitation crisis. So this is also a special day for us all. Um, but for those of you who don't know me, my name is Sarah Hale and together with my colleague Hans-Peter Arp, who you can also see there, we're leading Zero PM. <laughs> um, Zero PM is a Horizon 2020 research and innovation project and it runs until October 2026. And what we're trying to do is interlink prevention, prioritization and removal strategies to protect the environment and human health um, from persistent and mobile substances. So today's webinar is focused on prioritization and specifically the very vast PFAS chemical space. So I'm sure you're all aware that uh, of the environmental problems related to PFAS, but you might not know that a search in PubChem reveals that there are more than 6 million entities that match the latest OECD definition of PFAS. I certainly didn't until Emma told me. So in today's webinar, we're going to get a bit better acquainted with the new classification browser in PubChem, uh, which is called the PFAS tree uh, for short. And this will help us to navigate these incredible numbers. So we're very, very happy uh, to welcome Emma Shemansky and Evan Bolton to hold presentations today. You can see them there as well. This is lovely because we've just found Evan in the Zoom universe, as he called it. <laughs> <laughs> um, Emma is an associate professor at the University of Luxembourg and she heads up the environmental chem informatics and, uh, group. She works to combine chem informatics and computational mass spectrometry approaches to identify unknowns in complex samples and then relate this to um, environmental causes of disease. Evan's joining us very early in his morning from Maryland uh, in America. And his research combines chemical information, chemical informatics, no, yes, chemical informatics and data science approaches. So his expertise are very fitting for his position as the program head of many different things, but chemistry at the National Centre for Biotechnology, um, information, the National Library of Medicine and the National Institute of Health. So that was many. So I probably mixed some of them up there. But we know that they're very, very competent uh, to give this presentation today. What I just want to also say is we have, you would all be able to see the question and answer down at the bottom of your Zoom. So if you have questions, please post them there. And then towards the end of the presentation, we'll go through, we'll read them out. Any that we don't manage, we'll also get Emma and Evan to answer afterwards. So anything, please pop it in there. And I think without any further ado, we will let Emma share her screen and start her presentation. All right. We just need to pop it in presentation mode, Emma, and then it's... Uh, it should be in presentation there we go. mode, right? Yeah, we, okay. we have a slight delay then. Well, thank you very much for the wonderful introduction, Sarah, and thanks to all of you for, for tuning in today. So we chose this rather short and provocative title, Are There Really Six Million PFAS in, P um, in PubChem? Uh, just to note also on this title slide, you actually, um, I've already uploaded all the slides to Zenodo, so if you'd like to download, uh, these slides and look at them later, uh, then please do so through this uh, DOI link here or through the QR code. Uh, Sarah has also said she'll send it to all of you, uh, all registered attendees after the, after the webinar as well. So are there really 6 million PFAS in PubChem? Well, I'm going to steal my thunder straight away already and say no, it's actually already over 7 million, uh, depending on how we look at the breakdown of the PFAS in PubChem. Uh, so what I'd like to do today is uh, take you in a walk through uh, what we've done with this uh, PFAS and fluorinated compounds um, in PubChem classification browser, as Sarah introduced the, the PubChem PFAS tree for short. So I'm basically going to give you a little bit of background and motivation onto why we actually started this activity. Um, then I'm going to run you through the PubChem PFAS tree, the various sections that we've built in here. Then I'm going to go into a, a section on how many PFAS are really out there to help you explore this space. And uh, obviously, 6 million is a very big number to deal with. How do we find what's really uh, present in the environment or what's going to really help you answer your use cases? Uh, and then, as Sarah mentioned, we've got questions and discussion afterwards. So without further ado, just a little bit of background and motivation for what we're doing. Uh, 
here. So PubChem, as Sarah said, I don't actually work for PubChem. I collaborate with them very closely, as you'll see. Um, PubChem is basically one of the largest uh, open chemistry knowledge bases currently around. Uh, you can see here the landing page. So it's got 114 million compounds, 302 million substances. It's actually compiled from uh, 908 different data sources of which I am four to five, depending how you count. Um, so it's really, it's been built up from uh, information from a vast um, variety of different sources. If you go into the search panel in PubChem, then you can type in PFOA and you'll uh, land straight on the record for um, PFOA, like you see here. You can type in the CAS number, you can type in the SMILES, you can type in uh, a wide variety of identifiers and you'll basically land on, uh, on the results. They also have an extensive amount of information about the chemicals. So what you see here uh, on your screen is the a different classification browser, the PubChem Compound Table of Contents or the TOC for short. Uh, and here you can really see all of the different headings that you also see in the individual records and the number of chemicals that are associated with them. So if for instance, you're interested in finding associated disorders and diseases associated with PFAS, then you can click on some of these records and you'll uh, come up with uh, entries that look like this for perfluorohexane sulfonic acid uh, with the different uh, diseases, the original data source, and then also description and even literature references. You can also find all sorts of use in manufacturing inf uh, information as an example. So again, here you've got uh, the EPA CP DAT, chemical and product categories that a lot of people find very useful. Uh, they also, where they have the data, we have US production, uh, sometimes even the European production as well. So there's a huge amount of information available in PubChem. And here you can see at the bottom, the link to their um, table of contents browser. So the reason we started working uh, together with PubChem or one of the, the reasons we started collaborating closely was the Norman Suspect List Exchange. Uh, this is an activity of the Norman Network. Uh, we established this in 2015 as a very small initiative to exchange expert knowledge amongst a European environmental uh, network. Um, turns out that this grew beyond our expectations. So last year we published uh, our first paper on this with uh, 97 authors from 58 different affiliations. We've got over a hundred lists now in the suspect list exchange. So much smaller than PubChem, but still a, a similar concept. We're getting data from a lot of different people and trying to communicate this in the open space. So our first uh, collaboration uh, was really uh, how to integrate also the Norman Suspect List Exchange and this expert knowledge in PubChem. So we are also a data source. This is one of the data sources I am in PubChem. We are in PubChem. Currently, we have over 117,000 live substances, 20,000 annotations. I'll be talking a lot about these annotations. This is basically the expert knowledge that comes together with the chemicals. And we also have our own classification browser. You can always see here on the last updated. So we actually updated this last week. So we're regularly updating the content and making sure we have the latest information available. So our Norman Suspect List Exchange classification looks something like this. And you can see it's broken down according to all of our different lists. And for those where we have a lot of detailed content, you can see uh, here, um, you can see the little blue arrows, they actually break down into more detailed information. I've circled here a couple of our PFAS lists. So we, these were some of the very detailed lists that we started working on to get PFAS information into PubChem. But we actually have several um, PFAS lists already in the Norman Suspect List Exchange. So we've also been progressively adding this PFAS knowledge and this PFAS content to PubChem. So I'm just gonna highlight a few examples here. Um, we have, for instance, this great study from Juliana Gluga et al in 2020, where they documented a whole lot of PFAS uses. Uh, and so this was structured in such a way that we could uh, actually also integrate this into the classification browser according to the categories that they developed in their article. We've also been going back and looking through the literature and here's an example of uh, the postdoc work of John Martin, uh, where he published this in 2005, but actually the transformation products that he identified in that study hadn't actually yet been uh, added to PubChem. So we made sure not only were the structures added to PubChem, but also the relationship uh, together with the, uh, with the parent compound that he identified. We've also been keeping an eye out on the latest and greatest and uh, before we went into presentation mode, I think Christian Sweeney actually managed to join us, which was really nice to see. Um, so they published this study a couple of, oh, last year, uh, 
but they put it under a CC BY license, which meant that we could actually take this amazing um, NMR that they included in the in the article, not only add the new PFAS that they'd found, but also um, add and display the detailed analytical knowledge that they'd uh, added together with these PFAS so that can actually help everyone else uh, find and identify these PFAS in their sample as well. So that gives us a little bit of background of how Evan and I come to work together and uh, came to work together and how we started exploring PFAS chemistry. But our motivation for the current effort uh, was really kicked off when the OECD released their report in uh, 21, where they revised the PFAS definition uh, to include anything with a CF2 group in it. So uh, the previous definition had been at least a CF2, CF2 group. So at least uh, two carbons in the perfluorinated chain. With this revision, when Evan and I were discussing it, he just jokingly said, oh, this is going to be about 10% of PubChem. And then when you take a step back and go, okay, PubChem is 100 million, 10%, 10 million, that's an awful lot. So when we looked at this report, they had a very detailed figure of what they counted as uh, OECD PFAS and what were organofluorine compounds that don't necessarily uh, count as an OECD PFAS. So we were looking at this definition, looking at these details looking at the numbers that Evan had done on the back of the envelope and going, okay, how can we actually explore PFAS chemistry in PubChem with these kind of numbers? And this is basically what led to the um, PubChem PFAS tree that I'm gonna tell you all about in the next few minutes. So obviously, since it's a huge number, uh, we had to construct a special uh, way of dealing with this. If you just put PFAS into the search button in PubChem, it's not gonna work. Um, this is definitely the place to go. So let me introduce you in the next section to the various, uh, the, the next section of this talk to the various sections of the PubChem PFAS tree. So first I'm gonna run you through the organofluorine part. And if you've already got sharp eyes, you'll notice this is not the 6 million, it's already 19 million. So these are the organofluorine that aren't necessarily just PFAS. And then we've broken down the OECD PFAS into the, this section of about 6 million here. Uh, what you'll also notice is that we've also created the subsection that contains the PFAS parts larger than CF2 or CF3. So this is basically also getting back to the older definition that's not just a CF2, CF3, but anything that's a slightly longer perfluorinated chain. You can see the numbers aren't quite 6 million, but they're still a pretty scary 220,000. What we also found is uh, the OED's OECD report was extraordinarily comprehensive, but PubChem has an extremely uh, high amount of very interesting chemistry in there, um, probably more than you could necessarily imagine. Uh, so we also had to create this other diverse fluorinated compound section to kind of cover all of the other perfluorinated chemistry that we saw that wasn't covered in the OECD report. So it's a relatively small section compared with 6 million, but there's some very interesting things in there if you want to take a look. So I'll just briefly go a little bit through the organofluorine section. Not going to go into this in too much detail, but we constructed this in a way that uh, followed the classification from the OECD report. So if you look at the figure, um, we tried to match the headings exactly to their different categories so that we could break down the content uh, according to the various ways that they defined it. And you can see there's a lot of aromatic substances, 19 million, the vast majority is aromatic uh, and a minority is aliphatic. And again, there's also this other category as well. If we look at the OECD PFAS definition, obviously this is the one that's uh, probably more interesting to, the, to a lot of you. We can break this down in a number of ways as well. So if you expand out everywhere where there's a blue arrow, you can expand out the classification tree. At the top, we've got the molecules containing isolated CF2 groups. So you can see of the 6 million, uh, this is about 640,000. So it's a, a quite a large number. Uh, only very few of them, 8,000, contain CF2 and longer PFAS chains. Quite a few of them contain only isolated CF2, and then a few of them also contain isolated CF2 and CF3 groups. I can't remember if I uh, mentioned this, but just note, I'm going to mention this again later in the talk, this part of the tree actually does not include mixtures and salts. So this is just purely neutral compounds. Uh, we've got another section where we added the salts in. 
Um, obviously, the biggest uh, part of this, this part of the PFAS tree is the molecules containing isolated CF3 group. This is 5.6 million. Um, so this really shows the impact of this change of definition in the actual PFAS numbers. Um, this is uh, driving the vast majority of the count. And this is because there's a lot of um, drug discovery going on. It's the CF3 group is a very active binding group. It improves the binding of potential drugs. So a lot of these uh, might not necessarily be produced in large amounts, um, but they are very important for drug discovery. And this is also why they're in PubChem. And again, you can see, you can break this down according to those with CF3 and larger PFAS parts. And you can see right at the bottom here, the vast majority, 5.5 million, only contain isolated CF3 groups. And then, of course, we come to the interesting sections with the molecules containing PFAS parts larger than CF2, CF3. This is about uh, 226,000. Uh, I'm going to break this down in a bit more detail later. Obviously, what a lot of uh, people have used over the years have been what we call in our field the PFAS suspect lists. Uh, for this, since it's a very mass spectrometry specific um, terminology, we actually call them the PFAS and fluorinated compound collections. So this is a collection of expert knowledge from various open resources that we could integrate into the tree. So obviously one of the, um, the groups doing a lot of work on this is the EPA. They have a large number of PFAS lists. I'm gonna mention them a little bit later. From the Norman Suspect List Exchange, as I've already introduced, uh, we've got our PFAS lists as well. We've also collected various fluorinated chemical content in different classification browser trees in um, PubChem. PubChem actually have a lot of different classification browsers. We have a great uh, suspect list from NIST. Uh, and then we also have uh, an effort that we did with uh, Ontochem as well. And you can see this is uh, a much larger number than the other lists, but I'll get back to that in a couple of slides. So I already mentioned the suspect list exchange, so I don't want to go to this in too much detail. Here I just highlighted the two ones I had highlighted earlier, um, but these are also our other lists. Um, we described this earlier in our paper. We also have the NIST PFAS suspect list, like I mentioned. In terms of numbers, it might look like quite a small contribution, just under 5,000. Um, but I wanted to highlight this especially because uh, with this uh, addition, uh, Ben Place actually managed to add another 1,232 new CIDs to PubChem. So in terms of adding knowledge and filling gaps from the PFAS community, this was an extremely valuable contribution that actually enumerated a lot of series uh, that we actually hadn't received the discrete structures for before. As I mentioned, we grabbed uh, various fluorinated com uh, compound collections from within PubChem as well. So again, if you want to look at them more, they're broken down here. And I also wanted to highlight the work we did with Ontochem. I actually presented this in another webinar, so I won't go into too much detail um, here, it just also in interests of time. Uh, but in this study, we also looked at uh, the effect of different definitions on the structures that you can actually extract both from core documents, which is a literature repository and Google patents. Uh, and you can see here, this is the CF2 definition that we've been discussing. Uh, they managed to extract 1.7 million patents uh, using this definition, about 28,000 entries from the literature. Interestingly, like we've seen before, um, they're actually very complementary. So the coverage of both, uh, the patents do not exclusively cover um, what's in the literature. Then you can see with slightly tighter definitions, the numbers actually went down quite a bit, uh, depending on how you define it. So again, the PFAS definition is, is very, very important. Like I said, the, the winner in terms of numbers of lists, not numbers of chemicals, but numbers of lists is definitely the EPA. So they are constantly adding a new PFAS list to their compound collection. Uh, thankfully, Jeff has managed to integrate this in an automated manner, so we don't have to manually update this every time. Um, we've now got 42 different lists from the EPA. I just wanted to highlight a couple of uh, the most important ones we've seen used often in the community. So their PFAS struct list currently has about 14,000 discrete structures. Their PFAS master is used quite often. This is about 10,000 discrete structures. The polymer entries are not as a part of this. They've recently updated their CCL5 list as well. This only just went from draft to published, I think. And uh, but if you look at the total numbers, so every upper node actually summarizes all of the nodes beneath it, you'll see that actually we've got 16,000 um, discrete chemicals covered um, from the EPA. Uh, they've just recently published uh, an article about their efforts as well. So if you want to find out more, uh, I would point you there. 
We've also done some fascinating work in the last uh, few months uh, to try and also gather some regulatory PFAS collections. And, and again, a huge thanks to Andreas Buza, who has been communicating a lot with us and giving us a lot of ideas on how to not only integrate this content, but to present it in a useful manner that helps uh, solve some regulatory issues, or we hope helps solve regulatory issues, or at least help support. Um, so I've got a very detailed collection here. Uh, I'm gonna go through a lot of it, mainly with the example of PFHXS because this actually captures uh, a lot of the examples in a nutshell and again, shows the difference in definition uh, as well. So we have here for the PFHXS, we have the Stockholm Convention definition, but also an EU REACH definition where in the fine print, um, there's actually quite a difference in the number of chemicals that are covered. And we also actually have um, lists provided by the Stockholm Convention of which chemicals they think should fall under these regulations. So our first step was obviously to start with the existing lists that they have and to try and get these into, um, into PubChem, which we've done. And as I showed on the previous slide, these are actually all integrated within the browser. What's important to note is wherever you see this, um, these numbers in the classification browser, if you click on the number, you can actually send this to the PubChem search interface where you'll see the number of compounds. You can then filter them or sort them by different criteria. Uh, you can browse them, obviously. Most importantly is you can also download them. So if you want to save this data for later, you want to get the smiles or any other information, uh, this is where you should go. And again, the caveat, if you're beginning to notice that the numbers don't quite match up with the numbers that you know, uh, there is no polymer support at the moment. I'm gonna come back to that right at the end of my webinar. Uh, we're working on it, um, but just bear this in mind. So we've also, as I've already said, every a uh, major node is, uh, is also broken down into minor nodes as well. And these minor nodes make up the total numbers. So for instance, with this Annex A, we've created a subset where you can see how have we actually come to the 607 chemicals that you see here. And if you would open this up, you can see uh, we've got the various lists. So we've got the initial indicative list. We've got the various search queries that we performed within PubChem to find it. And you can see here, this is actually the major difference in the definition. They've actually got the sulfate moiety in the fine print. Now, and you can see here, actually, this search by smarts is uh, one of the largest drivers of the numbers. We've also done a similar back, uh, breakdown for the EU REACH uh, legislation. So there were two differences in the definition here. We had the C6F13S moiety, so no sulfate, but just the sulfur. And also they had in their fine print uh, a reference to any compounds that could possibly transform to PFHXS. So as you've seen in a few slides before, we have been progressively adding transformation information. You can see it's currently an empty node. We do have transformation information, but not occurring under realistic environmental scenario. So at least upon the advice we've had so far, we're not including any of those transformations in this list. We've also to help support people in exploring uh, this content, we've produced a node that is the difference between the definitions. So you can see actually scaled up to the PubChem contents at the moment, there's 112 structures that are different between these two definitions. And if you go to this node, you can actually browse not only all of the structures, if you go to PubChem search, but you can also uh, see how many of them have different annotation content. And I'm gonna get back in a, in a few slides to what the meaning is of this annotation content and how to get to it. But you can see here of the 112, we've actually only got relatively few with known literature or use or toxicity information. So yes, more on this later. I think the final, the most recent section that's uh, been causing Evan uh, lots of interesting informatics challenges. Uh, we can't underestimate the, the issues in actually dealing with these sheer numbers of chemicals. Uh, we've had so many drafts of this section, but we've finally got one that we're ready to show to you. Um, and this is the section where we've been able to add in the salts and the mixtures. So if you want to uh, have a quick overview of the difference between this definition with and without the salts and the mixtures, then look at the top um, section, the OECD PFAS definition versus this PFAS breaks down by chemistry. Again, it's the CF2 definition or longer or, um, or bigger, uh, but we've included the salts and the mixtures in the mapping. And you can see this is almost an extra 1 million uh, chemicals. We've broken this down in a number of ways. Uh, so you can see again by the PFAS composition, this is where we've got the neutral, so it's about the 6.3 million. Uh, 
by coincidence, a very nice round number for the salts and mixtures. This was not deliberate. It would have been even funnier if it was 999.999, but we've got 999,000 salt or mixtures. And again, for each of these, you can break them down by the different categories to help you explore this. We've also got um, the breakdown by PFAS part connectivity degree. So with this, we mean how many connections does it have and what is it actually connected to? So we've got here PFAS aliphatic or a PFAS connected to an aromatic. And you can see this is actually almost an even split. Uh, we've got some very bizarre things that always crop up. So we've got PFAS connected to chlorine, just randomly popping in there 10 times. And then we've got PFAS parts connecting to two. And this section gets very complicated. I've only shown a very small bit of it, but it gets very long. Um, there's a whole lot of crazy PFAS chemistry out there. Um, what's probably of interest to a lot of the mass spectrometry people, because you'll start to see diagnostic fragments coming up in mass spectrometry, is going to be this breakdown by PFAS part formula. So again, here you'll see we've got the C1F3. We've got the leading zeros in here so that it actually sorts in a logical order, um, so that you can actually intuitively follow the construction of the tree. Um, and for instance, if you go to C4, you can see that the vast majority are um, PFAS chains ending in the uh, CF3 group. Quite a few of them are C4F8, but we still see uh, a few more with a, a few fewer fluorines in them. This is also one of the really nice parts of this, uh, this tree is the breakdown by PFAS functional group. So this is uh, how you can dig down a little bit deeper and start to explore the connections by the chemistry. So PFAS connected to a C, you can break this down further, try to find uh, the carbonyl and then try and break this down further and find the carboxylic acids. And then you can expand that out further. And then, like I said, every section is actually has various ways of exploring it. So then you can start to break this down by carboxylic acid groups that have PFAS connected to various chain lengths, just as an example. Um, there are well over a million nodes in this tree now. So uh, you can certainly browse for hours and hours and still not see everything in the tree. Uh, and again, just, when you think uh, we've covered all the normal PFAS chemistry, if you really want to see some of the strange stuff, there's always some more cases or yet more cases hidden around and you can see some very, very strange things uh, going on there. So if you want some cool structures, that's always a good place to browse. But I mean, obviously finding cool structures is kind of fun, but for a lot of people dealing with 6 million PFAS is way too much. How many of these PFAS are really out there and how can you help or how can you use what we've done here to help you answer your questions. So I've broken this section down into a fair few examples just to give a, a little taste for what's possible. Uh, obviously we have extensive documentation and then I'm gonna go through a couple of questions who contributed new uh, CIDs, which is uh, PubChem's word for compound identifier, um, a few different advanced searches and then a little preview of functionality under development. So again, the PFHXS is actually a really great example of the challenges that we're facing in trying to compile this information and the challenges that you are all facing in trying to deal with PFAS. We have the different definitions. So for instance, different regulation, different definition. We have also the salt mixture isomer consideration. So are we just talking about linear PFAS? Are we talking about the branched isomers? Are we referring to the salts? Do you want the mixtures involved or just the neutral compounds? Uh, and again, yes or no to these questions can uh, have a huge influence on the numbers. So here, for instance, we just have five PFH excess and any branched isomers, but you can see if we have the salt in the mixtures, then suddenly this expands to 212. And then again, we have this annotation content, which can help add context as long as PubChem has access to that information that can help you. So just to point out that there is actually extensive documentation, wherever you see a question mark in the tree, there is actually um, a slight or a short or sometimes a very long tip about what each of these sections are. So wherever you see the question mark, if you click on it, a little orange uh, yellow window will pop up and explain a little bit about the node. It's in a hierarchical order. So if one node in itself doesn't make sense, just uh, look up a little bit further um, to the node above it. We've also got an extensive documentation that's uh, now several pages long. So if you click out to this uh, arrow pointing up, uh, this will actually take you straight away to a long PDF uh, full of more documentation. And wherever you see this link out, uh, it's also referring to other documentation that's specific to that node. So for instance, in the OECD PFAS, this will link you to the OECD PFAS report. 
So again, here there's a different node with the documentation. Uh, if you want to find out, for instance, a little bit more about the molecules containing PFAS parts larger than CF2, CF3, it's a slightly more manageable number than 6 million, but it's still a lot. Um, maybe you'd want to see how many of these have a C4, F9 linear chain. So you can go, this is again broken down to counts of molecules to make these numbers kind of tractable. You can browse down, you can find 11,900 chemicals that have a C4, F9 linear chain. You can send these to the PubChem search. You can also download these. And then basically, if you open up the download uh, file, you'll actually see a lot of additional information. And uh, there's a lot of gems hidden in here. So I'm just going to spend a couple of slides running you through the content of this file. So in quite a few of the columns, we've got just the basic chemical identifiers. We've got the compound identifier, uh, CAS numbers where they're available in the synonyms. We've got the name. Uh, inches and smiles for the chem informatics people that like these. We've also got a whole lot of calculated properties. So here you can get the X log P and various other properties that are of interest. Hidden towards the end is uh, what's very useful in adding context to the matches. This is the annotation categories. And I showed a little earlier in the webinar, this PubChem, PubChem compound table of contents. A lot of the headers that are coming in the annotation hits are also the headers that are shown here. So for instance, if you would see, you know, annotation hit a use in manufacturing, this would basically tell you that for this chemical, we have use in manufacturing information available. And even better, you can actually go to that section and see what is that information is actually relevant for your use case. And again, just pointing out, there's actually a wide variety of different sorts of use information. There's tables, there's plain text, there's uh, production statistics. There's a lot of different information out there. Uh, for the um, PFHXS, we actually broke this down uh, into a large number of the annotation content. But what we also did, we noticed, especially when updating it just uh, a couple of weeks ago, we've actually had 76 new CIDs added for this category since 2022, which given that we've only got 607 of them matching, that's a huge increase in just a year and a bit. So who or where did these CIDs come from? Who's giving this information? And are they actually useful for the regulation context? So again, if we click on the node, you can go straight to the PubChem download. And if we opened it up, then obviously I'm only showing a subset of this because this was actually all of the people who contributed in the last uh, year and a bit. So we see the sources that I've already mentioned. So we've got CompTOX, uh, DSS Tox is their code name in, in PubChem. We've got the Norman Suspect List Exchange. This is from our contributors. Patent scope, so getting patents from literature, my group. Uh, and again, we've got Kemble, which is another rather large contributor. But one of the ones that stood out was the Baker Lab. Uh, so Erin Baker and her group, they actually passed us, um, or they, uh, they added a whole lot of their collision cross-section values into PubChem. Uh, and out of this, they also added their internal standards, which is, of course, extremely valuable. So they had the 13C PFHXS as an internal standard. Not only do we have their collision cross-section, but we also now have uh, this uh, structure in PubChem. Also, again, just a note that all throughout the tree, we do have these isotopic variants as well. So you just have to be very careful uh, with the information, whether you want the non-standard isotopes or whether you have to eliminate them at some point. So again, going back to our PFAS parts larger than C2, CF2, CF3. Uh, if we want to explore this a little bit further, um, you know, how many of these were in mass bank was, is an example question. So again, we can send them to the download, uh, sorry, to the search window, but instead of downloading this time, you would want to push to entree. And if you push it to entree, we can start building advanced queries and exploring this content in a different manner. So this will send you to a page that looks like this. You start to see queries looking like one or two or three when they start to get very large. So it'll send 100,000 at a time. And then what you can actually do is send this collection back to the PubChem table of contents or to any other section in the classification browser. And then you'll get a window that says filter by entree history. So you can see from the numbers here, this was the right filter. And then now you can actually filter the table of contents according to just the PFAS that are larger than CF2, CF3. You can see, for instance, out of those, we have five agrochemicals, we have 21 uh, drugs, uh, 198 of them have toxicity information, uh, use in manufacturing information for about 4,000 of them, spectral information for 8,000 of them, which is quite a decent number. So 
if we would want to find out, for instance, how many of these are in MassBank. We can do the next uh, search in the table of contents. So this time relax the filter. So that again, we've got the entire contents, go down to information sources, look for MassBank Europe, send all of that content first to PubChem search and then to Entree. And then you can build an advanced search. So then you can select anything that was in the larger PFAS parts and in the MassBank collection, build the advanced query. Again, send this back to Entree. So now we've got the seven and the four together. Again, you can go back and view your, or download your structures. And you can see this time it's quite surprising. We only had 69 out of that entire data set that's actually in MassBank. But if we started to browse through it and take a, a little bit more information, so here we're landing on an individual compound page. You can go straight to the spectral information, see that there is indeed LCMS information. Uh, you can see who contributed it. If you scroll a little bit further, you get a, a little bit of a preview of the mass spectrum. And if you look closely, this was actually also a very recent contribution from, uh, from the environmental community. So from John Martin and his group, uh, we mentioned him already this talk. Um, they actually sent a whole lot of their data to MassBank uh, a few months ago. And again, just to highlight that it's not just the big uh, contributors to PubChem who are contributing this information. It's actually all of you who are researching PFAS, who are uh, sharing your data under a CC BY license. Um, we're definitely more than willing and able to integrate it where we can. And this is actually really helping to build um, the picture on PFAS and also support others in finding them as well. So if we want to look at it now from a slightly different perspective, how many agrochemicals in PubChem are actually PFAS? So we can go back to the table of contents, click for instance on the agrochemical information, send this to PubChem search. I, I sound like a stuck record, but this is always the gateway now. Uh, push this to Entree as well. So you get this advanced query. You can see here again, 3,090. 3, so the numbers are matching. And then we can, instead of going to the table of contents, now we go back to the PFAS and fluorinated compounds tree. And now you can start to limit this by the number of agrochemicals. And you can see that 476 of them are in the tree, but the vast majority of these are organofluorine. Still about half of them are PFAS. If you would want to break them down, again, we can get back to our number of the molecules containing PFAS larger than CF2, CF3. It's only five. You can very quickly get to the structures. You can also see here, if you break it down a little bit further, you have the option to only display active links and you can see actually how many chains are in them all and how long they are. You could also have a look at it, for instance, explore how many of these are in the Norman suspect list exchange lists. Uh, it's less than half of them. The vast majority of them overlap with a, a relatively recent contribution we had of uh, classified fluorinated agrochemicals. So that all seems to make sense. If you would want to explore the chemistry of them. So for instance, if you're concerned about a CF3 connected to an oxygen, because this is more likely to break down in the environment, you can then go to the PFAS breakdowns by chemistry and start to explore it in terms of chemistry. So we only have one connected to an oxygen uh, and we have one connected to a, a sulfate group. So just very briefly, I can't I believe I actually managed to do this almost within time. Uh, we've also been providing uh, download files to help uh, mass spectrometrists explore this. And I didn't think I'd have terribly much time to go into this today, um, but I just wanted to flag that we've created the database that is available from within Metrag, but also uh, for use within Patron and any other mass spectrometry workflows together with the different scores that we've been highlighting. So the annotation hit count, but also patent and PubMed counts to help sort uh, and add context to the data. And this will basically let you uh, put in a mass and search for different structures. If you've got the mass spectrum as well, obviously fragment them uh, and then sort the candidates based on the information. And you can see actually the different metadata really helps um, add context and information to the structural identification. So our future topic, I've mentioned it already a couple of times. Uh, Please note that this uh, PubChem PFAS tree is in the compound space. So this is all discrete structures. So where we have uh, a detailed structure. Um, so we have the neutrals, we have the salts and the mixtures, um, but we don't have polymers or the so-called UVCBs, so the chemicals of unknown variable complex uh, reaction products or biological materials. This is in work uh, or in progress. Uh, so here's a little preview of um, uh, 
Teflon. Uh, so this is, uh, you can see here, they've already got the connection to the monomer. So the monomer would be in the tree, except that it's a, um, it's a saturated bond, uh, unsaturated bond. So it's not uh, occurring in all sections of the tree. Um, but you see already the warning, it's not available because this is not a discrete structure, but we are working on mapping this actually to the discrete chemicals as well. So stay tuned for the polymer handling. Um, the advantage with having these at least available in PubChem, even if they're not in the tree yet, is there is uh, an incredible amount of information obviously available about a lot of these substances as well. Um, so all of this will be browsable uh, very soon. And yes, for those of you who like dark view, then there's another sneak peek of uh, PubChem dark view that will be coming out also very soon, which I discovered while I was compiling these slides. So are there really 6 million PFAS in PubChem? Uh, yes, there's more. There is, there's more, there's 7 million if we add the salts and the mixtures. The count keeps growing. So we're updating this tree uh, on a regular basis. Uh, so basically by next week, all of the counts will have shifted and most likely that'll have gone up. Uh, it's always moving. Um, that's why it's an interactive tree uh, ready to be sent to the download for you to get the latest and greatest information. Um, I hope I've been able to show you a lot of the functionality to help you explore uh, the information. Um, this annotation content is really critical to understanding the PFAS space. Um, so again, just to let you know, please reach out to us if you notice that there are structures missing um, that you have information on, or if you have data to add about certain PFAS structures, we're more than happy to hear this. Um, I've given my contact details here. Again, to point out our documentation, uh, this webinar is being recorded, so we hope this will also act as documentation. We've got an extensive PDF that we're updating as soon as we add new functionality. Obviously, this was not a solo effort. Um, a huge thanks to a lot of people. Obviously, Evan, who's done an uh, incredible amount of the coding uh, that I've actually <laughs> presented today. Uh, Jeff and Paul also from his team who are helping to get this updated and keep all of the uh, functionality working and patching it when we <laughs> send them an update that doesn't work. <laughs> Um, but also to Leon, Asta, and Sihuan, who've uh, been helping in the last few days to get everything uh, nice and ready for this presentation, um, but also the entire team. They're a great uh, crew of people who are working very hard uh, at making this a very useful resource, and, and PubChem as well. Uh, also, a huge shout out to my own team, uh, a special shout out to Paviel, who's done a lot of work on verifying the PFAS information. So a lot of, uh, of the examples I showed today was actually his work in uh, producing a lot of the files behind the scene. Um, Toro Kondic, uh, my postdoc, who's uh, the one who gets the joy of adding patent and literature values to ginormous files. Um, so a huge thanks to them, but of course, to my entire team. Again, just to point out, today's slides are available on Zenodo if you need to screenshot the um, the QR code or follow the hyperlink. Sarah will be sending these around. Huge thanks to my zero PM colleagues uh, and my funding from the Luxembourg National Research Fund. And again, community effort. Thanks to all of you who have provided us with data, who've uh, suggested other people provide us data um, or have shown an interest in this work. It's been great uh, to watch this thing grow and we'll be happy to move on to questions and discussions and, and get some feedback. And thank you very much to Sarah and Hans-Peter for this opportunity, of course. Thanks so much for putting this together and uh, giving us this great webinar. And more importantly, thank you for all this great, important work about PFAS. I mean, my mind is continuously blown when I hear about this PFAS PubChem tree. And, but it's not only just being blown, you show that it's, Sure, it's chaos, it's 6 million PFAS, but we can actually organize it, we can use it, we can start to navigate this space through these great tools that you're making through PubChem. And I think this is really so valuable. So again, thank you very much for that. And I just wanna also mention that um, earlier, this is our, actually the second time we talked about the PFAS PubChem tree. And so if you're inspired uh, by looking more into it and you thought maybe how the advanced search um, building was presented a bit too fast. In the earlier talk, we actually had an earlier talk with Emma on our YouTube channel, uh, 0 p.m. underscore H2020. There's actually a walkthrough uh, uh, and about the uh, PFAS pub country and uh, pumpkin PFAS tree. And you can go step by step and follow Emma so you can master, become a master of navigating. <laughs> so I will, uh, please look into that. And so now I'll uh, look at some of the uh, the questions that we got during the um, 
the webinar. And I think I'm going to focus uh, them more on the ones that are related to chem informatics, because there's uh, some people, of course, want to talk to you about bigger issues about PFAS, I think. <laughs> but uh, maybe we'll just start there and we'll see if we have time to go for the, the bigger issues. And so I'm looking at one from... Um, um, Okay, for, for Wolf, Wolfgang Deinlein, one, a good friend of, uh, of Zero PM, I'm going to filter these questions to be maybe a bit more chem informatics. And then this is one is why are you only focusing on PFAS and not synthetic organofluorine compounds? But I think these are also navigatable in the. Uh, yeah, exactly. So if it's uh, if you're interested in exploring the organofluorine chemistry, then that's uh, indeed the the second section with the 19.9 million organofluorines, and this will actually help you explore a lot of these. Uh, and we'd separated out the PFAS because, from a regulatory point of view, if people are going to be talking about regulating PFAS as a class, then this was one of our main drivers. You know, it's not the 10,000 that Eka just mentioned. It is really 6 million if you scale it up to pub chem size. And then mm -hmm. this is obviously just a huge number of chemicals to deal with. So, yeah, as you've seen, the entire tree is actually 20 million. And all of the, I'm <laughs> going to say, all, I'm sure there's some little thing that is escaping us somehow, but pretty much all of the fluorinated content in pub chem is in that tree somewhere, unless it somehow escaped Evan's algorithm. <laughs> <laughs> which is uh, maybe one or two, but we've basically seen everything in there. We've seen tiny radicals, we've seen the works. So it's all in there somewhere. Um, so Wolfgang, I hope- There's a lot of bizarre chemistry. There's a lot of very bizarre chemistry. So <laughs> That'd be a good follow-up webinar, bizarre chemistry. I, I want to attend that one. <laughs> I mean, if someone wants to do the bizarre one, we could, we could do the, the weird and wonderful PFAS in PubChem because <laughs> every time we explore the bugs, we find all the strange stuff. Oh, fantastic. But, yeah, and I'll, the, and I'll, I just want to say also just want to plug a previous uh, interview we did with Jian Yun Wang, who was one of the authors of the OECD report that defined PFAS, but he also talks about organofluorine compounds and why these were not included. But so check that one out too on the YouTube channel. Sorry, Emma. Yeah. But yeah, the, this, this whole section, I didn't go into it in a great deal of detail, but the organofluorine section actually does have a detailed breakdown as well to, to help explore Indeed. how many of those CF bonds are aromatic, how many of them are aliphatic. Um, so again, if there's anything of interest, uh, just reach out to us. Yeah, and then there we're probably getting closer to that 10% of uh, PubChem mm -hmm. that you, yeah. It's that closer, you yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, 20 million. <laughs> so it's uh, it's closer to 20%, so. Yeah, even more, so wow, amazing. And uh, follow-up question from Wolfgang is, do you see a rising trend in organofluorine pesticides? So I guess this would be like Wait. time that they're on the market. <laughs> we're seeing rising numbers in almost every category. The numbers are increasing constantly. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's, I have not yet seen anything that's gone down. Well, I guess Which things is... can only go up. It's <laughs> the entropic nature of our universe. <laughs> But uh, yeah, but I guess another thing to couple that to, which you can in PubChem, but I mean, maybe the data is more patchy is uh, market data. Like what is the volume produced, sold, these type of things. Um, how's the data uh, on, how patchy is the data related to that? I was gonna say. If you have there. annotation, we'd be happy to uh, to add it. Um, so uh, oftentimes trying to understand the, the best data sources for information is a tricky prospect. And then having somebody to um, basically make that content available to us in a way that we can use it is always a tricky proposition. But oftentimes, uh, if someone does the work, if they have it uh, fielded out in some fashion, we can use and, and uh, utilize it in the context of PubChem. Sorry, I'm just getting over a cold. So <clears throat> if you see me mute or, or do something else, you'll understand why. No, no, that's fantastic. No, and your voice is like really raspy. It's pretty cool, so. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Cool, nice. Um, and I think this question was answered. It was about the um, uh, about the source of the molecules, but uh, you were showing how you, you can identify sources about who submitted the, the PFAS and, and where. So I think that was answered. During yeah, exactly. So if you want to do that, then you would send the section of the PubChem tree, PFAS tree that you're interested in to the table of contents, and then you can actually browse according to the information sources, and then you can start to see uh, but there are a lot of information sources. So sometimes, again, the download file can be an interesting way to go through because then you see uh, 
see that information in an overview, but the other way to do is, is go to the classification browser, the table of contents and, and explore that way. Mm -hmm. yeah. But sometimes and, and you can also trace them back to the, um, the original publication in some cases, uh, or the original patent where the was original source of the data. So uh, there are a number of different ways that you can go about trying to find or determine the original source. Because mm -hmm. where PubChem gets it from may not be the original source where it came from. So very good. And and I would say like as a as an environmental chemist who's working with a PFAS in the environment, uh, my good best starting point is the Norman Subsets List Exchange because these are a lot of lists submitted by environmental chemists looking at the uh, the same problem I am. And so that's a good starting point uh, for me if I just needed to have some kind of smaller lists to get my head around it. Um, next question um, from Andreas Busser in Switzerland. How, oh, sorry, this is slipping away. How uh, may the non-standard isotope example, uh, 13 carbon uh, be eliminated from the results? Yeah, that's a good question and <laughs> nice to see you join so you us can do this in entree uh you yeah. can remove any uh, chemicals that have isotopes uh in the context of of there prior to then sending it back in entree has a a large number of field indexes and filters that one can use uh, so if you look at the pubchem documentation you can learn more about how to approach that but it, it is a long list and it is a very powerful set of tools between the PubChem search, the classification browser, and the Entree interface. If you want to do it quickly from the download file, you can look for any smiles <laughs> with the square brackets in it as well. And this will obviously, oh, we usually flag the isotopes very quickly. So the, I actually misread that question, thought he was asking how many non-standard isotopes need to be eliminated. There's actually not that many of them, but obviously for the for the well-known PFAS, there are quite a few people with internal standards now, and some of them are beginning to sneak through. But in general, it's a very small proportion of the numbers. Great, thank you. And here's a question from a PhD student, Rahul Agarwal in ZOVM, and it's about Comtox. Um, so um, are all the PFAS and Comtax on PubChem? M? And um, yeah, or, or there might be there are some data gaps between the two. I mean, go from Comtax to PubChem. Well, there's always going to be some form of um, an update delay between Comtax and PubChem. So if they add a structure in tomorrow, uh, PubChem won't see it until the next update that comes from Comtax. Mm -hmm. um, but generally speaking, all of the Comtox structures that we're aware of are uh, inside PubChem. Um, and so they'll be flagged in the context of the tree. We are regularly updating the Comtox lists. So in a, on a monthly basis, so this should appear uh, as those are there. If any structures are uh, found uh, that are not yet inside PubChem, there'll obviously be a delay before those show up. But for all intents and purposes, they should be uh, relatively in sync. Mm -hmm. And to give Very credit nice. credit to Jeff, uh, as soon as we see a new list, he usually <laughs> updates it. <laughs> so it's monthly with more regular updates when when more comes in. Um, but also where it's directly taking whatever is listed in their list. So if there are other PFAS and Comtox that aren't in any of their lists, this will not be captured. But that section of the tree is meant to represent exactly what Comtox think are in their Comtox lists. Right. Yeah. We don't modify their lists. Yeah. We take it as is <laughs> automatically. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, uh, great. Uh, and the next question comes from another friend of 0PM, Harry Timmer, who asked actually a very 0PM uh, related uh, question. Is there, a, um, is there a standard method of analyzing, reporting, and documenting and registering precursors? So precursors and transformation products. Please answer. Uh, that was going to be my question. So precursors as in transformation product precursors or precursors in a different context? That, that's how I would. I would, I would assume that uh, just say you saw PFHXS. Uh, what are the precursors? I mean, would, that, would there be a way of uh, reporting that, but also finding that? I mean, we have the transformation section and we do have uh, templates for producing the transformation or the information in the transformation section. But I'm not sure that's exactly what he's asking. Um, so that would be a qualified yes. There is a yes. uh, templates 
uh, for the, this type of content, and uh, we'd be happy to uh, work with them if if they would like to provide this type of data. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We we can get in contact with him. Yeah, definitely. Um. So a question about analytical uh, methods. Would you be able to get uh, analytical methods for PFAS uh, from from the PubChem? In some cases, there are identification uh, methodologies that are specified, um, but uh, there's the list is not extensive, uh, but you may find some for PFAS. Uh, if there are others that are willing to be contributed, we'd be happy uh, to consider to have those added in. So in the PubChem table of contents, this is the identification header, if I am remembering correctly. It may be, there may be some information in different sections, but this is the one that has a lot of the standard information okay. from our point of view we also often look for whether the pfas have been measured in mass bank like if there's mass spec information or nmr this can also tell at least whether someone has uh, measured it in in some form of analytical information and, and as a community can, oh, sorry so yeah this can actually uh, like we did with uh, the example i showed of christian Sweeney's work uh, not only do we uh, put the reference to the data set but we also put the reference to the paper and through that you can actually get back to the original resource and find out how they did the analysis. Mm -hmm. oh, perfect. And I'm looking at the time and I think we might have to wrap this up soon so we won't get to all the questions, but maybe I thought this was a good one to add uh, to end with. If somebody wants to provide you more information for the uh, PubChem PFAS tree, how would they do so? Oh, that was on my, I think my third last slide, please just email us uh, and we'll find the right routes uh, to get the information in. So uh, if you need the contact details, uh, the slides are downloadable, but uh, put in the PubChem help email address or also just email me and we can we'll sort it You out. can go to the, the PubChem website. There's also a um, submission uh, portal. And so that would be another great way to get in touch with us so that we can uh, work with you to add your community related data out to the community. Uh, it is a community resource. And the more that we all work together to provide this data to, we provide a forum in the context of PubChem uh, where you can then spread and um, share information to your colleagues. Well, thank you so much. And I think that's a great note to, to end on is sharing and being part of this community that's helping to tackle PFAS. And uh, again, so great that you could give us this important presentation on PFAS at uh, World Water Day, uh, which is being marked by several uh, events around the world. And I will also, uh, mentioned that this webinar will be available on that same YouTube channel I talked about earlier, uh, 0 p.m. underscore H2020. So like and subscribe, and you'll be sure to see it. And speaking of uh, World Water Day, I'll also say during this webinar, a whole series of interviews with uh, different experts uh, and academics and NGOs about what does zero pollution mean to you, just uh, premiered on our uh, YouTube uh, channel. So if you want to see more uh, discussions about PFAS, please go over there and you'll hear from diverse people also dealing with the problem of PFAS. Uh, so with that, I'd like to thank you again, Emma Shemansky and Evan Bolton for this very important work. And uh, from Sarah Hale and I at 0 p.m., we want to thank everybody for watching. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank for you. Bye. Bye-bye. 0 p.m. Zero Pollution of Persistent and Mobile Substances. This project has received funding from the European Union's Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Programme under Grant Agreement Number 101036756.